just a little bit about lasagna love. Uh, so the reason why I made that impact certificate is because I think sometimes we focus on things that scale and we forget about the things that don't scale, right? The things that happen in our, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, the things that happen just you know, from one person to another, right? So I, I wanted to kind of bring attention to that and bring attention to lasagnalove.org. So you can check that out if you're interested. Um, so my name is Kate Sills and I'm an engineer, a software engineer in the blockchain space. And today I'm gonna to be talking about blockchain education as a public good. So I have a problem and you might have a similar problem to the one that I have. And the problem that I have is this. When I tell someone what I do, um, I get one of two responses, right? So the first response that I get, and, and none of these are good by the way. So the first response that I get is, isn't it just a bunch of scams, right? And then the second response that I get is, uh, right on, I actually just put all of my retirement savings in insert scam here, right? So <laughs> there is a problem, and I think it's actually a knowledge problem, and I think it's that people are unable to evaluate blockchain projects. And it goes beyond just my own you know, personal discomfort in this conversation. Um, people are actually losing their life savings, and good projects are unfairly maligned if everything seems equally risky or scammy, right? So, so I think this is a problem that at least I personally am very motivated to work on. So why am I talking about this at Funding the Commons? So blockchain education is a public good. Um, and so if we look at like, for instance, Eleanor Ostrom's um, matrix of what a public good is in her diagram of you know, common pool resources, public goods, private goods, and toll goods, uh, we see that knowledge, it's in the area of low subtractability of use, and it's also in the area of high difficulty of excluding potential uh, beneficiaries. So it is um, non-rivalrous and also non-excludable, right? So it's a public good, and that makes it really, really hard to fund because you can imagine in the blockchain space, one company spends all of their time doing all of this education, and then another company can just free ride on that, or worse, uh, a third company might be in the space and benefiting from the kind of the, the ambiguity and lack of information, right? Whether they intend to or not. So one, one part of my background, I, uh, I double majored in computer science and cognitive science, and I have never used the cognitive science aspect until today, so it's come in handy. But um, what I learned was that effective education is uh, understanding and correcting a student's already existing mental model. So this is very different than how we used to think about education, right? We used to think about education as, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm taking knowledge that it is, that is in my brain and I'm inserting it in your brain, right? It's just this like direct transfer of knowledge and now you have it and you can go off and, and do things with that knowledge. But that's not how knowledge works. I mean, you know, we've all studied for an exam and then basically forgotten everything after that, right? So how it actually works is that we construct mental models. Um, so there's this great paper that I like um, by Edward Reddish, who's a physics professor, and he talks about how to use the learnings from cognitive science in teaching physics. And it turns out that students come into his class with all kinds of incorrect mental models that they've learned just through experiencing life. And so one thing that he points out is that these mental models, they may be contradictory, uh, they may be incomplete, they may be confused with similar things. So we might, you know, um, find uh, the similarities confusing. You might be confusing similar things. And it may be used as a heuristic to save time that we would otherwise be spending thinking. So he says that how to change someone's mind, if you really want to change someone's mind, here's how you do it. You have to propose a replacement model. And that model must be understandable. It has to be plausible. It has to be seen as useful. And then the most important thing is that you have to show that there's a strong conflict with predictions based on the existing model. Okay, so now let's get into the blockchain mental models. Um, so what I chose to do was to look at two main blockchain books. These are actually books that an econ professor told me that he uses uh, with his students in his classroom. So these are things that people actually are using as teaching tools. And uh, the first is The Truth Machine. Um, and the second book is Blockchain Revolution. And so it's gonna seem like I'm picking on these two books, but I think they're actually just representative of the types of books that are out there. 
And in fact, if you look at like the blurbs for, for instance, the blockchain revolution, it's kind of a who's who's list of, of everyone, right? So the, the biggest people in business are saying these are the books that you should be looking at uh, when it comes to learning about blockchains. So there's more of this, but that's just a little bit of that. So um, there's a lot that I wanna talk about in regards to the mental models of these books, but I'm gonna focus on one specific thing, and that is digital signatures. So I'm gonna go over what I see as the, um, the correct mental model for digital signatures, and then we'll see what mental model the books might be thinking or might be creating and compare the two. So just a little overview of digital signatures. Uh, they're not new, they've been around since the 70s. And the way that it works is basically you create a very random number. And that's effectively your private key and it should be kept secret. And so now you can sign messages uh, which creates a digital signature and that's unforgeable. And so no one else can create this digital signature, only you can. And so by digital signatures, I wanna make sure that you know, we're not talking about just a digital representation of you know, your handwritten signature, right? Um, we're talking about data. The signature that is produced looks a lot more like the signature on the right than the signature on the left. And then once a, a signature is created, um, you can give it to someone else and they can verify it. So the way that that's done is that you uh, derive a new number from your private key, and this one you can share publicly. So let's call it your public key. And then anyone who has that public key can verify that your signature is valid for that particular message. Um, so one thing that's important to note is that digital signatures do not do any encryption. So you can kind of think of it as like a stamp on a document. Um, you can still see what's on the document, um, nothing about the document is hidden, but there's a stamp on it. And then uh, signed messages are tamper evident. So because a signature is only valid for a particular message, um, if that message changes at all, that signature is invalid. And uh, digital signatures don't require a blockchain. So blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum, they make extensive use of digital signatures but digital signatures existed uh, long before Bitcoin, and they're one of the cryptographic primitives that decentralized blockchains use, along with cryptographic hashes and proof of work and things like that. So um, many of you have already probably created digital signatures if you've submitted a transaction to a blockchain, right? So when you sign and submit a transaction, you're actually creating a, a digitally signed message with your private key. Okay, so, that's kind of the correct model. Now let's get into some quotes. And then, you know, I kind of want to do this as an exercise. So if you can kind of think with me and think about the mental model that these people might have or they might be trying to create in the reader and compare that to how we think about digital signatures generally, I think you come to some really interesting conclusions. So let's look at some of these quotes. So we needn't worry about weak firewalls, thieving employees, or insurance hackers. If we're both using Bitcoin, if we can store and exchange Bitcoin securely, then we can store and exchange highly confidential information and digital assets securely on the blockchain. Okay, so it seems like they think that because we can store and exchange Bitcoin securely, we can exchange highly confidential information on the blockchain. Okay, so that is not quite right. So I'm gonna be compiling uh, a mental model here and I'm gonna put a check for something that I view as correct and an X for something that I think is not quite right. But, but we'll try to compile it and see where we get. So they do say that Bitcoin is secure, but uh, they get it wrong that we can actually put highly confidential information on the blockchain. Okay, and then the truth machine says, uh, one of the most important non-currency applications of Bitcoin's blockchain could be security itself. So that's interesting. They think that there's something, there's something very secure about blockchain beyond what we might get from the cryptographic primitives. Um, so, and I think where they're coming from is that they might think that blockchains protect against hacks that reveal private data, right? So that's not accurate. So the blockchain revolution says uh, the blockchain is encrypted. It uses heavy duty encryption involving public and private keys. That is not correct, everything's in the clear. So let's add that. Uh, but they were correct that blockchains do involve public and private keys. 
Okay, so why do they think that things are encrypted? I think this is where it gets really interesting. So they say that it is rather like the two key system to access a safety deposit box. Okay, this, this is also very incorrect, but um, I didn't know how a safety deposit box worked, so I looked it up, and this is what it looks like. And the point of it is that, you know, you are renting this from a bank, um, you put your stuff in there, and then when you want to access it, uh, the bank employee has a key, and you have a key, and you have to use the two keys together uh, to be able to access what's in the box. So you can kind of see where they're coming from, where they think that um, there are two keys, and then you, know, you can put something securely in there, and then you have to have the two keys to access it. Turns out to be completely wrong, but you can see what their mental model is. Um, so let's, let's add that. All right, so they say, when the user signs their public key with their private key, that action mathematically proves to outsiders that the user has control of the underlying information and can then assign or send it to another person's public key. All right, so it seems like they're saying that the user uses their private key to sign their public key somehow. So that's not quite accurate. And uh, let's see, so they say that um, the concept of a signature entails combining two associated numbers or keys, one publicly known and the other private. So we can see there's this idea of like combining keys, um, which, which is not right, but it's very interesting because I think it goes back to that two keys of the safety deposit box model. All right, so now these quotes are gonna be a little bit bigger, so I'm gonna try to summarize. But um, if we have a crypto cryptographically signed certificate from some institution, uh, we're vulnerable to that institution's unilateral power to revoke its signature. Okay, so they think that digital signatures can somehow be made invalid, right? Um, and somehow this is connected to President Trump uh, revoking the rights of transgender soldiers, okay? And um, the same risks always apply with digitally signed rights when they don't reside in an immutable record. So it seems like they think that there is um, something that digital signatures are lacking that you might get from putting the record on a blockchain, for instance. Okay, and so then they say, note the deliberate choice of the most secure permissionless blockchain, Bitcoins. In a permissioned blockchain, the central authority controlling the network could always override the public keys of the individual and could revoke their educational certificates. So it seems like um, they think that if someone has central control over a blockchain, they could somehow uh, override or uh, invalidate the digital signatures. And that's not correct. So let's add that, those to our mental model. Um, they seem to think that the signed message can be tampered with without anyone knowing. Uh, they seem to think that control of a blockchain allows you to control the private keys or signatures or public keys or something like that, right? So, you know, I might be getting this mental model wrong. Maybe they meant something else entirely. I don't know. But I think there are some significant differences between that and what I see as the correct mental model. So that was just one example. Um, as I was reading this, there were a number of other things that, were, that I saw as wrong. So for instance, that blockchain consensus produces truth, and that providing a solution to the quote unquote double spend problem allows blockchains to guarantee the uniqueness of assets generally. So then there's the question of how do we fix wrong ideas, right? And it's really hard to do. So if we go back to uh, what the physics professor, Reddish, said, um, we have to understand the audience's particular mental model. And everyone has their own unique mental model, right? Their own version. And then we have to somehow convey the correct mental model. And then in order to actually perform the switch, in order to replace someone's mental model, there must be a strong conflict with predictions based on the existing model. So the way that I would view this is that we have to tell people something true that contradicts their current model. And another way to think about that is we have to tell them something surprising. So I see kind of three ways in which we can do this. Uh, the first is basically what I've been doing so far is, you know, we have to read and critique. And uh, that's great, but I think it can only take you so far because critiquing things is not particularly fun. Right? Like, no one wants to be the person being like, oh, that's not right, you know, and, and raining on someone's parade, right? Um, the second thing is user studies. And then the third thing is, uh, and I'll talk about this a bit later, is creating surprising products. So 
First, uh, so there have been user studies that have been done, and they're really interesting. I'm sure um, people in the audience know of, of many more than I do. Um, but so here's one of them where they brought in, I believe it was 29 people into a lab, asked them their ideas about how a blockchain works, and uh, this is actually one of their diagrams. So you can see it's kind of hard to read, but I think there's a miner up there in like the admin zone or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's just like really fascinating what people might be thinking, because if you're just making a transaction and submitting it, um, it there's no particular reason why you might know how any of this works, right? Like it, it, it makes sense that people may not know how it works, but how they think about it is really interesting. So the takeaway that I want to leave you all with is that I want to propose that we create surprising products. And I'm going to call this products that break people's brains. So I'll give an example. Um, so there's this thing on Ethereum that you might be familiar with called the proof of attendance protocol. It's, it's just for fun, but you get a token if you attend an event. And I think we can change this to be entirely off-chain. And the reason why I want to do this is because um, I think it will actually create the kind of conflicts that we need in people's mental models so that we can bring them to a better understanding. And so the way that this would work is that an event organizer would use their private key to sign a claim that the attendee attended the event. And that would produce a signature that can be verified by anyone who knows the public key of the organizer. So it would not be on a blockchain, it's just a digital signature, just data that you could pass around, you could send in an email, you could send in a text message, you could put it on a website, you could you know, have a gallery of all these different badges, that sort of thing. And it creates, I think, exactly the right kind of conflicts. There's no blockchain, but we still get this tamper-evident document if we store the signature. And it uses public and private keys, but it's not encrypted. So if we go back to the mental model that we, you know, that we talked through, this uh, violates a number of those assumptions, and hopefully it would make people rethink things. So while knowledge is a public good, I think we can create products that aren't. So the products themselves can be excludable, and therefore they might be profitable. So for instance, uh, for you might be able to um, have people pay $5 to make one of these fun event badges um, without a watermark and have like the free version, you know, be with a watermark or something like that. And I think going against the common mental model might indicate a market opportunity. Because if no one's thinking this way, then no one's thinking this way, right? So, you know, the danger here is that you might make something that breaks the mental model so much that people find it implausible, right? So that is always a danger. But I think the more that we can build fun little products like this, the more we can actually produce knowledge in a way that makes it a public good, but we're doing so in a way that we know how to do, we know how to make these products, we know how to make them profitable. So uh, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if I have time for one question maybe, but um, thanks again.